Hello, and welcome to Cataloging Basics. My name is Margie Shepard, and I'm the Library Technology Consultant for the Central Kansas Library System. While this presentation is about cataloging, I would also like to discuss the many parts that come together to create an original or a copy cataloged record. I will discuss access points and authority control and what those terms mean. We're going to take a look at MARC records and go over the fields that make up a record, plus how subject headings and authority control make records better and why they matter. And no discussion on cataloging would be complete without discussing RDA and FERBER and how these two acronyms and what they stand for have changed the way we catalog today. And finally, we will talk a bit on classification and how you classify makes things easier to find in your library and in your catalog. I'm also going to talk about copy cataloging using and using Z3950 searching and what to look for when choosing a record, as well as how to check for records in Pathfinder Central before importing one. And I'm going to give you a few tips on what to look for when choosing the right record that matches the item in your hand. We will cover how to make minor edits and update you on the fields to fill out when attaching holdings. At the end of the presentation, I hope you're going to go away knowing more about cataloging and have a better understanding of the parts necessary for good records and what a robust searchable catalog needs. For me, I do much better when I understand why I'm doing something. So before we launch into cataloging, I want to give you a little background. So all of us practice cataloging in some way, shape, or form every day. You may not realize it. So think about the way you organize things at home. Do you arrange your spices or your closet a certain way? Do you have a calendar you use to keep um, track of reoccurring events and a system that you use to do that with? What about your personal library? I tend to group books by series or author. So all my Harry Potter books are together. All my Aragon books are together. In my desk, I have the paper. I have paper clips in one spot and thumbtacks in another. So these are all examples of a cataloging system. So why do we catalog? Well, we catalog for a number of reasons. We do that for, our ben for the benefit of our patrons, first of all, so they can locate things not only in the library, but also in the OPAC or the online public access catalog. We catalog for you librarians and your staff and we do this so if, for instance, during an, a reference interview, you know exactly where to go to find something for a patron, or for instance, if you're trying to shelve things, you know exactly where to put those things. We also catalog to keep track of the many things that you've purchased to put in your library. We track circulation stats or how often someone uses materials in-house. You may also want to keep track of hardware or objects in your library that you lend, such as uh, computers, or if you lend uh, e-readers. At CQLS, we do this to uh, keep track of the uh, things in our IT department. So for instance, if we loan you a barcode scanner, we know exactly uh, where we, uh, who we loaned it to and when we did that. So cataloging is also used to describe and differentiate between the formats available. So for instance, if you have a large print book or regular print book, what about audiobooks? Are they on CD? Are they playaways or is it an MP3? Games, they come in different formats. Books come in the format of paper book back. They might be board books. And we also catalog so people can find things. For example, if I'm searching for materials written by Mark Twain, and know him as Samuel Clemens, good cataloging will allow me to find those materials using either search term. So how librarians and staff think? Well, we are charged with trying to keep control of a lot of different uh, materials within our library. So if we are consistently trying to maintain control and know how to access information, library staff has to use some sort of logical thinking. Uh, we need some understanding of the way to arrange things for easy access, not only in the building, but in the catalog as well. And after we create a system, we have to have a way to let people know how we arrange things so they too can find those items. This is when control comes into the discussion. Without control, there would be no consistency. 
So this is how we think. Um, we start with the general. So for instance, let's think about the entire book collection or how a work is presented, such as the carrier format. And then we have to move to the more specific. So if we have the big category of a collection, and let's say it's books, we can further that collection down, narrow that down into the juvenile fiction books, the nonfiction books, adult fiction, adult nonfiction, young adult, and so on. And each subcollection can be further narrowed down. So for instance, board books, picture books, so you get the idea. So when a patron comes in, they ask these kind of questions. I want XYZ book, do you have it? If, you, if I want to know if you have XYZ book, where do I go to get that information? Or if they found a book in the catalog, where is it located, et cetera, et cetera. So patrons, they are asking pretty specific questions. So as we move from the general to the specific, this helps us answer these kinds of questions and makes our patrons happy when we have the right answer. So let's think about what catalog, cataloging actually is and what it does. Well, it's a system of organizing, isn't it? So I talked about this a little bit ago. Think about how your mind works and the way that you organize and the way that you go to find things. This is the way that we work within our catalog as well as in our library building. There are a lot of different ways to organize. And while the slide lists um, ways to organize things physically, or that might come to mind, these are also reflected in our cataloging practices. So we arrange things by author title, uh, alphanumerically in the call number, numerically uh, using the Dewey Decimal System, sequentially in a series, etc. You might put all the DVDs together, you may organize the, the audios together, so there's all different ways to classify and organize materials. So how do we get there? With all these things to consider, um, we have to take the bibliographic description and add that classification in order to create some sort of cataloging system. Um, it is a bit more complicated than that because we're not just a local catalog. We're a consortial catalog and the things that we do impact a lot of people. So what is what? Well, descriptive cataloging is the first thing we're gonna discuss. And this deals with the physical nature of the work. And this is where it can get really confusing for a lot of people. When we talk about bibliographic description, it is just that. The only concern is the physical characteristics of the item. So for instance, the author, the title, the editors, illustrators, the place of publication and who published it, how many pages it is, if it's a DVD, how long is the, um, the extent of the work. So when we talk about um, the subject of an item, we think about the intellectual parts that make up the work. For instance, um, what if the subject was health? If, if we were using uh, the Dewey Decimal System classification, those items would be classified in the 600s. More specifically, 610, medical science and medicine, and further, 613, promotion of health. The point is this number lives only one place on the shelf or in the ILS for that matter, and the more subject headings we have, the more points of access there are for the item. In my example of Mark Twain, if I have an interest in materials by their humorists, if the subject humorous is listed on the record, it will lead me to things like this. And many subject headings provide many points of access, and many points of access find things much more findable. Okay, so in a nutshell, this is descriptive cataloging. What it's not concerned about is the item's subject matter. It only pertains to describing and identifying the item, and it provides access points to locating that item. The subject analysis is an action. When we're looking at a work, we're gathering all the information about the subject to create access points. Sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's really hard work. Some of the things that come to mind are examining historical documents. It takes a lot of detective work to find out the subject of that work and what makes that material significant to the collection. So for instance, uh, many genealogy things that we have are recreated by uh, family members. And you have to kind of dig to find the who, what, when, where, why, and then create subject access points. And uh, this will also 
help make uh, the, help you discover if that particular item is worth putting in your collection if it has relevance to your um, area. All right, access points. Access points are exactly what the term infers. They're kind of like little doors. So access points are specific pieces of information such as the author, title, or subject of the work. This standard information is common to all bibliographic records and is used to locate records or additional information. So users locate items in a catalog through access points. The more access points, the better. It's easier for users to find what they're looking for if they have lots of things to choose from. There is such a thing as a primary access point, and we only have one primary access point, and that is called the main entry. This is the person or the group responsible for creating the content point, content. And the bib record, this information is found in the 100 field of the MARC record. There are other access points, but those are known as added entries, and they include the title, publisher's uh, information, the series, general notes, and the subject headings. Those are located in the uh, 200s, the 600s, the 700s, and 800s. I've mentioned authority control a little bit, so I wanted to explain to you why it matters. We um, already have established the need to be able to organize information that makes, makes sense to users. And one way to do that is to make sure everybody who catalogs is on the same page. So authority control means establishing a recognized form for an entity name and using that form whenever the name is needed as an access point in a bibliographic record. So uniform spelling of names, places, and topics is one way to establish control. And where we place the information in the record is also controlled by numeric identifiers. And all this comes from recognizing that names, people, places, and things and concepts are the real deal. This data is applied by using uh, an authority file which organizes information in a catalog. And all this information is then linked together. So there are a lot of benefits for using authority control. And without it, a catalog would have information entered in all kinds of ways and not serve its users well at all. So um, here's a great example of different ways to describe the same person and the different ways to present this, represent this person in a record. So which one is the best one? So we have Diana, her single name, when we have her named as the Princess of Wales, and then there is uh, dates of her birth and when she died. So you'll see, you see there's six different ways that people have come up with uh, to represent Diana, Princess of Wales. So uh, which one is actually the best? Well, if you chose number three, you're correct. And you might ask, well, who decides the best way to represent her or any other person in a record? Well, this is left up to the Library of Congress authorities. This is the source for all authority headings. And this is not the only source, but it is the one that we at CKLS use um, exclusively. And I'll uh, get to finding authorized information in a bit, but first I want to take a look at the MARC record. So what is MARC? Well, it's basically a data storage unit. It's where we put all of the important information about a bibliographic item, um, or rather the bibliographic data about an item. The letters stand for machine readable cataloging. And this system was created in the 60s as a way to record um, data from English monographs. It's computer readable, which is great. And it makes sense of all the data in a record with the result being what we read in the staff client and in the OPAC. This, it is the standard format for library automation. There are many, many fields of variable length and content. Some are repeatable and some are not. But it, MARC record is the standard uh, library automation format, at least right now. So here's your traditional data container, uh, the card catalog. And if so, those of you that remember cat cards, there were stacks of them that would come with one record because you needed to file them in all the different places that uh, people may go for access points to, a, to for an item. And here's the new container. It's pretty compact, you see. It has the author, it has the information about the publisher, it's got the title, 
It's got the, uh, the format, um, et cetera. So all this information uh, is contained in one file versus a card catalog that we used to have. All right, so here's parts of a MARC record. There are, the numbers are also referred to as tags or fields. Uh, there are a lot of different fields. Uh, these are the ones that I think that you as copy catalogers should probably most be most concerned with when you're um, comparing records. And one field that's not listed on here that's worth mentioning is the 024 field. So when we catalog, catalog at CKLS, if uh, a UPC located on the back of the book scans instead of the ISBN, um, this can be um, cause a lot of problem for people. They immediately don't think that this particular book or uh, item that you have in your hand is in the catalog. So what we do is we add this number to the 024 field or the other standard other standard identifier, excuse me, other standard identifier field to make it easier for you to locate the record. All right, so subject authority and headings. Um, subject authority is uh, best described as a group of words or a word used to describe what something is about. These come from a listing of terms that have been agreed upon or approved by a group of people. The spelling is controlled uh, and there's no variation in how the term is presented. There can be multiple subdivisions within a subject and the Library Congress, as I mentioned before, is one authority. So here's an example of using uh, subject headings. So I pulled the book, True Survival, Apollo 13, Mission to the Moon. And um, within this book, there are different subject headings attached to the record. But if I was put in charge of trying to locate subject headings, how would I go about doing this? Well, the best place to start is the authorities, the, uh, the Library of Congress authorities. Um, within this book, it was already noted that these subject headings were discovered as the best ones. So what I want to do now is kind of take you on a little bit of tour of the Library of Congress subject heading authority file. I'm going to go out of here. I'm going to go back a slide. And let's go right here and I'll take you on a little tour. So uh, if we were going to have to discover the right uh, subjects for this book, I would go here. So let's log in. And the first box that you see is a, a search box where you can put in a subject and see if it's authorized. So um, I want to go ahead and just start out looking for space travel because I'm not really sure exactly what, what, what um, headings would be the best for this book. So um, you can see the search type. You can narrow your searching down. Um, I generally just go ahead and let the um, entire uh, search run. So we're going to go ahead and begin our search. And immediately you'll see space travel at the top. While it's not an authorized heading, it does have some references. And this is sometimes a good place to start, especially if you're not sure where to begin. But let's just kind of scroll down here. So we're looking for authorized headings. So the first authorized heading that comes up is Space Tracks, and it's a musical group. So I'm not really sure who that is, but it might be interesting to look at sometime. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this, and here's references. So you'll see right away, here's um, links to the authority record. So the authority record for space travel would be here, but I'm going to go and look at the seas. It's not going to be interplanetary voyages or space tourism, but I'm going to look at space flight. So within space flight, there's all kinds of headings, but none of them, well, this one might fit our, this one might fit, but I don't think it's really quite what I'm looking for because I don't view Apollo 13 as an adventure. So I'm going to go back here and start a new search. Um, I'm going to go ahead and search for Apollo 13. That's a pretty obvious uh, place to start because it's in the title. All right, so right away we pop up with authorized heading of Apollo 13, the motion picture, and here's the spacecraft. As I scroll down here, we authorize heading of the spacecraft attached to um, the subfield spacecraft, and then I've got an authorized heading of 
spacecraft accidents and juvenile literature. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that. So the easiest way to take transform this transfer this information into your record, I just copy and paste it. And it tells you right here which field to put it in. I, uh, if it starts with, this is the Library of Congress headings, but this would go in the 610 field. And the 610 field is the corporate name. Uh, so we would copy and paste that right into the record. And you can go ahead and search all kinds of things. Um, I'm just going to move on here and show you, I kind of alluded to it earlier. Whoops. I get to our slide. All right, so here's the subject headings that were associated with that book. So we had Apollo 13, and then the topical form of accidents and the form is juvenile literature. The next would have been space vehicles and the geographic location of the United States and juvenile literature and so on and so forth. So if you went into our catalog brought up this record, you would see that these are the linked subject headings associated with that record. So let's go ahead and whoop, take a look at that. So here is the slide. Uh, the box in red shows you exactly where these um, subjects are, and they are all linked not only on the staff client side, but in the OPAC. So clicking on them will lead you right to um, other books or materials associated with those subjects. All right, so one of the things about subject headings um, is there are some exceptions, uh, if, especially if you cannot find the appropriate subject heading that matches your work. You can add them to the 653 field in the MARC record. Please do not make up um, subject headings uh, because they're not authorized. So this is the place to put um, something, a term that's not derived from a, control, a controlled thesaurus or a subject heading system. So please do not make them up. Um, it's just not a good practice. The other field I want to mention is the index term or genre form. So people get conf confused about what to do with cookbooks or diaries or directories, etc. So those that's the overarching term for the item, but inside the subject headings or the subject uh, terms would then be what the book was about. So for instance, if you have a cookbook that's all about desserts, and then you would subdivide it into cookies or chocolate or pies or what have you, those would be the terms that you would use in your 650 field. All right, so now um, we'll talk a little bit about FERBER. So FERBER, or Functional Requirement for Bibliographic Records, um, was recommended in 1998 by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Um, it was to restructure catalog databases to reflect how users search. It's made up of groups of entities, and it is the basis for RDA. And the best, things, uh, the best thing about these entities is they translate well into RDA data elements. So Ferber is actually very conceptual. So the main entities that I will mention here are the work, meaning the body of the work. So for instance, uh, Hamlet, and it was created by a person, William Shakespeare. And then you take those two and combine them together and you discover the subjects. Okay, so we have a Ferber and now let's talk about RDA. So RDA is a cataloging standard along with AACR2. So AACR2 was is the uh, international cat cataloging code that was used for descriptive cataloging prior to 2013. It was re regularly updated until 20, uh, 2005. Uh, plans to update it further were scrapped. Uh, but what it does is it uses abbreviations and a unique set of terms to describe a bibliographic record. And most of the uh, way that it's used is in Latin terms. So RDA, Resource Description and Access, is the standard that we currently use. It was adopted fully by the Library of Congress in 2013, and it's the successor to AACR2. It's the standard for descriptive cataloging, which we talked about earlier. What's really great about it is very flexible, and it lends itself to all kinds of different schemas. And I like to call it what you see is what you get, because when you're cataloging, uh, and you're using, so the information, say, off the title page, 
however you read it and what you see is how it goes into the record. So for instance, if the title is all in capitals, you'll see that reflected in the RDA record. So here's an example. I just took this um, out of a book title page and you can see that everything's spelled out. You have all of the authors. We know the department where it was, where it was uh, created at the University of Wisconsin and who illustrated it and who the contributors are. So if we compare the AACR2 version in the 245 field, you'll see um, in the Mark field 245 now in RDA, uh, it would be, as you see below, the AACR2 version has a lot of abbreviations, a lot of information is left out. But below this, uh, this version uh, lists four authors. So that's what RDA says to do, it conclude at least four of the people that are contributors to that work. So there are a lot more differences and I'm not gonna get into it too deeply, but one thing that RDA does, we don't use abbreviations anymore unless you actually find them in the work. Um, in RDA, if you don't know of a place of publication, you write that out and you bracket it, as well as the publisher not identified. If you um, can't supply publication place, bracket that and put a question mark. If you're not sure the date, do the same thing. So classification. So why do we classify? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, we like to organize things and classifying helps us do that. So it helps us find things, makes our collection and our OPAC much more browsable. Um, it's easier for your staff to work and know where things go so things can circulate better. And it's another way to organize. So here's the classifications that are most commonly used. Um, Dewey Decimal System, um, it's a numerical breakdown by topic. Uh, the Library of Congress um, also is used, but I, we don't see it much in public libraries. It's more commonly used in academic libraries or medical libraries or special libraries. One exception is fiction. We don't usually use a classification number. However, many records that you'll see will have a, a Dewey Decimal System number associated with them. And we use call numbers. It's kind of the address of the book in your library or your catalog. So here's a picture of Melville Dewey who created the um, classification system that we commonly use. All right, so let's get cataloging. Um, I have included some cataloging terminology for you. Um, Copy cataloging is, cataloging is what we're gonna be concerned about today. And basically what you do is you find a pre-existing uh, bibliographic record and you, um, instead of creating it from scratch and you use it for your purposes. Um, Z3950 searching uh, is finding records electronically that are available through other sources. The holdings uh, shows ownership or where things are located. The bibliographic record, uh, is all the information that represents your resource. And the title page um, is at the beginning. It bears the title, that bears the proper title, the statement of responsibility, and oftentimes the publication data. One term that I have not included on here is the verso, which is usually opposite the title page that has all the publication information. So tips to pay attention. To when cataloging. Um, you know, really look at the record carefully to make sure that it matches up the format of the book that you have or the DVD or um, of the audiobook. And not all records are created equally, so do take time to look at them. And if you do this, paying attention to these details, it's going to make for a wonderful cataloging or wonderful catalog, excuse me. All right, so cataloging materials in Pathfinder is pretty easy. Um, from the landing page, what we do is find the cataloging button, and I'll demonstrate to you, this to you in a little bit, but I'm just gonna go over the steps here in the slides. So you find the cataloging button, and I like to catalog from this particular button. It makes things a little easier than just searching the catalog. So once you click on that button, you're going to have another window pop up um, where you're going to put the information about your item into the search box. I usually start out with an ISBN, uh, search and you click the submit button. So if a record appears, then the first thing you need to do is to verify the information is correct and matches the item that you have in your hand. So this is what is going to, you'll see um, when you 
put in an item into the box. So in the far right corner is an actions button. If you click on that, you'll have some choices. You can either look at the mark preview, and I hope you'll do that, or you can look at the card preview. But whichever one you choose, um, just make sure you kind of go over the, the pieces of information and compare it to your book. If you do choose the card preview, you're going to have to rely on the information that's in that box because it doesn't completely give you the whole picture of the, of the item. So here's an example of the card preview. Um, so you'll see you've got the author, here's the extent of the work, um, you've got some information about the, um, the book, um, and there's some good subject headings located as well in this record. If you decide to use the mark preview, again, in that page, you have all kinds of information about um, your record. And now that you know what these fields mean, you can go right to it and compare your item with the record that you're viewing. All right, so ask yourself some questions. You know, does the mech this, does this record match your item? You know, make sure, is it the title absolutely correct? Does the ISBN match? And I will mention that um, a lot of the publications now include ISBN, ISBNs for all of the different formats. So just make sure that yours is actually on that record. Is the addition correct? Um, does the format match? We've, we've seen a lot of uh, electronic uh, records being imported when we really are looking for a book record. So you have to be really careful. You know, check your pages. Um, is it close? Does it match? These are things to look at. Oh, and by all means, are there subject headings? If there's not, please don't import that record. All right, so if you can't find the record the first time around, don't give up. Enter uh, the title in the search box, or you can enter the title and the author. And also make sure that the ISBN that you've entered um, is correct. There are some um, publishers such as Scholastic that put a ISBN uh, on the back of the book that does not match up with the content inside. So open the book up and make sure you look on the title verso or the opposite uh, page of the title and compare that number with what you're scanning in the back. All these are ways to make sure um, that the record is not in Pathfinder before you go searching for one. All right, so let's say that you can't find a record and you have to do a search for it. Z3950 searching is an information and access retrieval protocol. So what it allows us to do is search other people's records and import them into ours without having to recreate um, a record. So you would go ahead and click on that button, Z3950 search, if you can't find one in Pathfinder. And this window will pop up and you can populate the data that you have in the fields and conduct a search. Uh, for DVDs, you need to put that information that looks like the ISBN or it's through the UPC in the standard identifier box. Personally, for me, I don't select all the targets, I just usually do a search the first time around with um, the ones that are already pre-selected. It's just easier for me, but if you wanna search all, you're certainly more than welcome to do that. So when um, you conduct your search, you'll end up with a box like this. Now notice we have one, two, three, four, we have seven different records uh, for this cat book cataloging library resources. So in the actions page, just like on the page that we had for um, searching in Pathfinder, you'll be able to look at the mark record or the card, uh, the data card. Just make sure that you compare that the format's correct, the pa pages match up, and you pick the record that's the best one for your um, item in hand. Now, if you do by chance bring in a record, uh, Pathfinder has kind of a, a record check. So, um, it might think that it's a record that's a duplicate because of the title, um, even it, and it could be that it is actually the right record. So you can click on that little two box section and compare, and if it is your record, go ahead and just click yes and go ahead and attach your holdings. If it's not, go ahead and save as a new record. I see this a lot when um, cataloging different formats. So um, go ahead, don't be afraid to bring in a record if it doesn't match up. So I am a little bit about holdings. Um, we uh, at CKLS used to only have you do eight and D 
O, P, and Y, but with uh, experience, we've learned that it's time to add some other things to make findability better. So we'd like you to populate H, which is the collection code. We want the date that it was acquired that populates in on its own. The source of acquisition, this is where we would like you to record your, um, your initials. And if you use it also for the store or the vendor that you bought the item from, follow that with a backslash and then put your cataloging cataloger initials in there. This helps me help you um, make, do, make better cataloging choices if there is some problem with your record. Then add your call number, the barcode, uh, cost of replacement for the item. We have um, we use this data when we're trying to uh, charge patrons back for lost items so we can then go by and go back and delete the item from the catalog and then choose your item type. You know, I know that we have a lot of item types in there. We're trying to get people to just uh, choose book if it's something with the cover and pages and not use item types as collection codes. So we'll talk more about that later on um, in another webinar. So after you've populated this, you can go ahead and click Adam, add item and your um, holdings have, will have been added to the record. So there are some times when it's po you need to go ahead and tweak a record a little bit. This is perfect, perfectly fine. Um, you might do it when the pages are close, if the size is close. You have to remember that cataloging is, is all done by people, so sometimes people make a mistake. And when we talk about pages, it's the actual printed page number that you see. So if there's 400 pages and there's 10 pages afterwards, it's not 410 pages, it's 400. So it's what you see is what you get. And it's followed by the word spelled out pages. Size, we always round up in cataloging. So if it's 23.5 centimeters, it will be 24. Um, we do have a lot of libraries who break up combo uh, DVD and Blu-ray packs. So this is another time where you would edit a record. So if you're not sure if you have a record, please send it to CKLS. We'll be happy to help you create something that matches your item. And a little bit about fast adding. I know there's times when you need to do it, but the problem is we have so many records that librarians have fast added, but they don't go back and um, create a better record. So I really would prefer that you try not to do this. Um, it causes a lot of clogging up and unnecessary bad records in our catalog. All right, if there's any questions, we're gonna do a little bit of practicing. Um, questions in this instance can be forwarded to me by email, you all know where to find me. Um, but right now I wanna go and show you a little bit about how to do some of the things I talked about. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and log in to Pathfinder. And I talked about going to the cataloging tab. This is where you can find that. So I have a couple books here that are um, from the catalog. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna do is scan the ISBN to see if it's in the catalog. So here's a book, The Labyrinth of the Spirits. So um, it looks like a pretty good match, but I wanna make sure that it is actually the one that I'm looking for. So I'm going to go over here and click on the mark preview. And here's the mark record that's gonna pop up and show me everything about this book. Uh, you can scroll down and see um, the information that is contained on the title Verso. This is all your publication information. We've got the title, Labyrinth of the Spirits, a novel, um, 805 pages, that all matches up. Here's a series statement, The Cemetery of Forgotten Books, and it's got a lot of really great subject headings. So I would go ahead then and attach my holdings. And one way that you can get to that, if you're convinced this is the book for you, go ahead and open the Actions tab and click Add Edit Items. So here's where you then would go ahead and attach your holdings. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but here's a place that we really want to start encouraging librarians to use this. Put the information about the number of pieces. So let's say I was cataloging a um, DVD and there were maybe an extra booklet in there that you're gonna keep with the uh, uh, DVD when you check it out. You might wanna make a note in there. 
because when the librarian or the staff person goes to check it in, it's going to remind you that there was a booklet along with that DVD. Or maybe you have an audio book that has 10 discs. This is a great place to put that information because, again, it will pop up and it'll remind your staff to check to make sure all 10 pieces are there. I can see this being used with cake pans if you've got three pieces that go with the cake pan or maybe a kit or puzzles. Um, there's all kinds of play, uh, kinds of things that we have that you could use this uh, field to help keep everything together. The other place I really want people to start um, populating is the shelving location. I know if your library doesn't use them, this might be a hard thing for you to start doing, but it certainly is um, a good way to help you find things. I think we sometimes have mistaken the use of the item type as a shelving location. So you'll see we have so many different item types, but really they're not truly item types. Uh, they're more collection or shelving location uh, terms. So kind of start think about using that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead now and we're going to do a search to see back here, excuse me, cataloging. And we're going to search the catalog for another book and see if it's in the system. And if not, we're going to go ahead and pull a record in. All right, so there, this is a book that I have in my personal library and there's no bibs found. So there's nothing in it in Pathfinder. But before I go ahead, I'm going to just try by putting in the title just to make sure. And you always want to do this just to be sure. We'll submit that. All right, so actually, here it is. Uh, this is the book, but I'm looking at it, and it looks to me like it's a paperback edition. Um, and the one that I have is a hardback. My pages of the book that I have in hand are the same pages but mine is hardback and it's uh, 23 centimeters. So uh, this would be an instance where I would go ahead and click on new from Z3950. So you'll see the search box pops up and I always kind of clear this out because for some reason it, it doesn't always, it's not very uh, friendly if you try to search using all this information that's pre-populated. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop this in here and see what happens. And again, I tell you, I don't do the search all. It's just the way that I search. So it's certainly up to you um, to choose the way you want to do this. So I usually go right down to the OCLC sources because we're fortunate enough to have that as an option. So I'm going to widen this up a little bit. So the mark preview of this book uh, looks pretty good. Um, you'll see right here it has all the different um, ISBNs. So I really want to get down here and look at the format. It's 471 pages, illustrations. It's 25 centimeters. So this probably would match up my book. It does have all these um, great subject headings, but I'm usually not, I'm not satisfied always with the first one. I want to make sure that there's not something better. Um, This one is not very good. You can see it doesn't have the pages in it. It doesn't have, uh, it's not quite complete. I mean, it's okay, but it's not great. Uh, well, let's go up and look at this one. This one's not bad, but again, this is kind of strange right here. Uh, it's not spelled out. Um, it doesn't have all the RDA fields that I would like to see, so probably wouldn't choose that. So popping back down to this one, we'll just look another one. Here's what a card preview is like. You can see it doesn't give you quite as much information as using the uh, mark record format. Uh, again, we have quite a few to choose from. And again, the reason probably is is so many people catalog this book. So I'm going to go ahead and import this. You click on the import button. And you'll see the field to save the mark record. So obviously, when we got it in here, Pathfinder did not um, pair it up with that other records. So um, this is when you go ahead and save it. And oh, here it is, duplicate record suspected. So here you can look, verify that this record's not does not represent yours. Um, it's not the same. It's a paperback. So I know that it's not the one that 
I want. So I'm going to go ahead and save this as a new record. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and uh, attach my holdings. So let's say that I needed to do some editing. Maybe the, this was close in pages or it was off a half centimeter. So go into the mark, click on mark and go into the edit tab. And we're going to go down here and we're going to edit the record. So this will open up all of the, the mark record fields that are available to be tweaked a bit. So I know that the 300 is where the pages are. So if this was, if I had 473 pages and everything else about this record was perfect, this is where I could go and make that change. So I could alter that here, click save and, and move on. Um, so it's really a nice uh, way of taking a record and personalizing it for your catalog. I wouldn't do this in um, the OCLC. I would do it within our catalog. So here's an, uh, a great uh, example of all the subject headings that come along with this record. So I'm going to just click on this military relations. Um, it doesn't ha seem to be linked to anything in our catalog, but maybe Great Britain is. No, it isn't. But if it were, it would take us to other um, books in the catalog that have the same subjects. I don't know, diplomatic history, it doesn't have it. But the point being is you can see that if we did have these things, they would be um, linked. I, I am going to give you a view of what the OPAC looks like for this, because I think it's a good idea to see it. So I'm going to log in as myself. And... We'll see, Oops, citizen, oh, it may not pop up because I don't have holdings on it, but we'll, we may get the other uh, copy. So there we have it, we do have it. We have, this is the one that's available and here's the one that I brought in. So um, you can see what that looks like. Okay, well, uh, I do have a couple other things. Here's a resource uh, cataloging resource page that if you're interested in, it's uh, in the file uh, that I have shared online. It'll show you some other cataloging resources to help make your cataloging easier. Uh, I also have some resources for photographs included, but you'll be more than you're you're more than welcome to go on and look at those on your own. So. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation, and if you have any questions, please contact me at the system. Thank you.